experts in the field of political science and the economy. Our first guest is Professor Ferguson, an American political, political scientist. Uh, his articles have appeared in many scholarly journals and is founder of the Investment Theory of Party Competition. Uh, our second guest is Mr. Ha Yung Chung, a uh, South Korean institutional economist, author of some international bestsellers such as uh, 23 Things They Don't Tell You About uh, Capitalism. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you all here with us and uh, let's start a, a fruitful debate. So the first topic we will discuss is uh, the differences in countries' reactions to COVID-19. And uh, I first have a question for you, uh, Professor Ferguson. Uh, on the 11th of March 2020, the WHO labeled uh, COVID-19 as a pandemic. This is already more than a half year ago. However, uh, COVID-19 has exposed weaknesses of countries, their social safety nets. Uh, this disease has everybody's attention at this moment, and therefore a lot of public and private um, money shifted to countries, their healthcare systems. So, um, Professor Ferguson, what do you think? Uh, because of this process, will uh, healthcare remain the most important topic of the political agenda the coming years? Well, look, First of all, may I just say I'm glad to be here and delighted to be alongside Ha Jun Chang, uh, who I respect very much like. This is so different from the average panel discussion automatically uh, there. And I'm also pleased that, you know, finally a, a Dutch operation has uh, got a chance to talk to. Um, now, look, on your question about is healthcare going to be big? Look, as long as people are dying, or getting really sick, because you have to remember, you get this long COVID problem. That is to say, it's not like everybody gets well and then they're well. They a lot. You, there's clearly going to be a lot of people with serious symptoms for a long time. This is going to be a major deal. It is also, however, intertwined with the economy, and you can see just the reactions to the lockdowns. I'm just going to call up that uh, in what Spain, Italy. Uh, which is a quasi-lockdown, France, and even Germany. I think the only stock on the German market that went up yesterday was something called Delivery Hero, <laughs> which you can see how desperate things are. Uh, it's got, this is a first-order mess. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, yeah, what, what our interest is, has is at this moment we see a debate about inefficient uh, healthcare systems. So take the US, for example, uh, citizens keep away from uh, medical care because they fear the bill, uh, because they're not uh, insured, and hospitals are largely uh, funded by private companies. Um, and if you take uh, China, uh, for example, there are healthcare systems with a universal healthcare insurance, uh, for example, 95% of uh, the Chinese citizens is um, insured. Um, so do you think, um, Ha Yung Chang, uh, is this uh, so a centralized uh, system, healthcare system, uh, will it better handle collective problems like pandemics? Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, I uh, repeat uh, uh, Tom's uh, kind of uh, expression of pleasure to be here. I was uh, physically in University of Amsterdam uh, two, three years ago, uh, exactly in this forum. Unfortunately, this time it has to be online. So I, I really hope uh, I have a chance to do this uh, with Tom again in the near future, physically. He's uh, been most wonderful supporter of uh, bringing diversity to <coughs> economic research, policy discussion, and uh, general intellectual uh, development. So. I uh, would like to thank him for that. Uh, yes, I think that uh, you know this uh, crisis has uh, shown that no one is safe unless everyone is safe. Huh? I mean, you uh, uh, talked about the healthcare. Yes, I mean in countries where healthcare coverage has been patchy, there were a lot of uh, the people who didn't go to the hospital even when they should have because they were afraid of the medical bill. In countries where they don't have uh, the, the mandatory the sick pay, a lot of people kept on working despite being sick, uh, thereby spreading the disease. So I think that uh, you know, 
I mean, of course, that uh, that that you the the have uh, different political consensus and the uh, institutional mechanisms in different countries. So I'm not uh, saying that that uh, every country should uh, adopt the same system, but you know somehow you have to make sure that everyone is uh, included in the system because when you have something like this, when you have you know, the, the other systemic challenges like climate change, you cannot just uh, protect a subset of people, you know, according to whatever criteria and usually money that, that you come up with. I mean, you need universal coverage for certain things like uh, the health. Otherwise, uh, it doesn't work. Right? So, uh, so that I think uh, that's uh, the biggest uh, lesson that, that, that we can draw that, uh, from this uh, the pandemic. Yeah, so may maybe then uh, our economic measures such as uh, helicopter money or universal basic income, are those alternative, uh, appropriate alternatives to uh, fight uh, such pandemics? For Ha uh, Yung-chan? Uh, yeah, I think uh, the, you know, the, the interesting thing is that countries that have uh, the introduced some form of helicopter money or uh, some rudimentary form of uh, universal basic income are actually countries that do not have a good welfare state. You know, the U.S. used those, uh, South Korea used those, exactly because their healthcare system, uh, sorry, welfare system isn't uh, that uh, fully universal. So in the countries where they have a better welfare state, I mean, uh, you could, of course, that there, there there are kind of you know, corners where people were left out, you know, that, uh, what do you do with the self-employed people and so on, but that, that generally, you know, in countries with comprehensive uh, universal welfare state, uh, there was uh, actually less need to send out these uh, random checks and, you know, uh, introduce uh, that, uh, at least one of uh, the universal basic income. So I think, you know, that, that paradoxically speaking, I mean, that, that the fact that, that some countries have had to use it is a reflection of their weakness rather than their, their, their strengths. But uh, having said that, you know, yes, I mean, in the crisis situation like this that affects everyone, and when there is uh, such little time to select who deserves the payment and so on, I think it's uh, better to just uh, get those money out. And then uh, if you want to uh, tax them back uh, later, because that uh, if you try to uh, introduce some kind of means testing at this stage, especially in a country with that, that uh, weak uh, welfare state where you don't have enough information about individuals, it will only delay things. And, you know, I mean, uh, a lot of people are uh, starving and uh, having problem with uh, making, uh, sorry, meeting basic needs. Uh, so I think that, that uh, you have to uh, do uh, these things that, that uh, uh, if uh, that, that your the basic welfare system isn't uh, good enough. Hmm? Mm -hmm. And uh, well, related to your argument, argument. Uh, Could I just a uh, comment on please. Hajun's? Yes, I, please, I'd yeah. love to ask him a question because he's really good at comparative economics and he knows the Asian system. My observation um, was that at the st that first of all, I looked at both what happened at the start and what people said was happening at the start. There were all the and when you look at most every data. Uh, the one I like is excess deaths and a rate. I mean, uh, there. But I'll even take COVID cases if one has to, because in many cases, that's all you've got. And we have real data problems with uh, lots of countries. I could see it in the U.S. state of Georgia from time to time, and I can see it in other countries, including, I think, China. Um, the um, But here's my, my, my take was, Everybody had a chance to do something right first, and which was quickly closed down. And the Australians and the New Zealanders did that. I mean, I, my hypothesis would be these people had reaction. They had previous, they were close to China. They had previous experience with viruses coming from around Asia. And they also knew, and one Australian was quite blunt to me saying, we can't possibly deal with this if we don't close down immediately. And so you could help yourself with that. Um, but then the countries in the rest of Asia that have done well, as far as I can tell, looks like you know almost your classic Asian developmental state where the bureaucracy actually works pretty well. 
and the functions they do are to test uh, and then contact trace and then isolate. And my sense was they've done that pretty well. The year, when you look at excess death rates in uh, the rest of the world, uh, and the excess death data are not great, but um, it's the Nordics less Sweden and um, Germany that have the lowest excess death rates. That was as of three or four weeks ago, but you can see everywhere in Europe, this business is breaking down and they have clearly not spent the time in sort of testing, tracing and contact. And the only other comment I wanna make on that is there's a failure that behind all this, and it's uh, the regulation of telecommunications is a latent variable in a lot of this, in the sense that, bluntly, uh, I, in the Asian developmental state, they don't ask you whether you like being traced um, on an app. Um, in the rest of the uh, West, uh, they usually, there's a lot of very quite justified resistance, realize, realizing that these large companies that want to do apps will hold the data uh, and keep it. And that's made everybody mistrustful. If this is a case where if the government had regulated telecom right, you could actually use apps very quickly. Those technical cap capabilities exist. They're not used in the West. Uh, but for good, suspicious reasons by the population. No, no, I think uh, that uh, you made all the key points there. You know, the, first of all, you know, there was difference between countries in terms of uh, the, the speed of reaction. And uh, part of it was uh, the, you know, technical problems, but a lot of it was about, you know, I would say the hubris and Matter of trust, uh, so that uh, first, in terms of hubris, you know, that if you take only enough action, you can actually contain this with the relatively primitive uh, the capabilities. Yeah, look at that. That's, yeah. yeah, and and the very poor, some very poor countries, you know, that uh, Vietnam, you know, Ethiopia, Rwanda, the Indian state of Kerala, you know, they've all uh, contained this uh, disease uh, pretty successfully without South Korea or you know, Hong Kong level the, the administrative machine and the technology. So I think uh, that the uh, hubris was uh, one thing that uh, sank uh, some countries. But also I think uh, that the more important point that you have made is uh, this issue of trust. You know? Because if you want to contain it, you need that, uh, that uh, needed that uh, to start this uh, test tracing that uh, isolate uh, policy very early on, but uh, in some countries, there were just too much uh, political resistance towards that, not because of uh, this uh, the facile kind of cultural differences, you know, mm -hmm. obedient Asians versus, you know, more independent uh, Europeans or Americans, but because of exactly what you said, I mean, the regulation of the telecom and other kind of uh, the, the information industries that gave people some degree of uh, trust in this uh, centralized system, you know, that Koreans are the, the pretty wild bunch, you know, that we managed to depose at a, at a, no less than the, the three presidents uh, through mass uh, demonstration. No, I agree. The last, I yeah. never believe the compliant Confucian society. That's right. that stuff. I tell people exactly. Korea has about the South Korea has one of the most contentious labor histories anywhere. It's like interwar Absolutely. Japan. Yeah, exactly. So that. that yeah, that, that you that, that just that, that said uh, what I wanted to say. So, you know, people are not going to that, that accept it sitting down unless there was some trust uh, in the goodwill and the capacity of the government. And that links back to the history of uh, development of state. Of course, uh, it has been modified and eroded and so on, but uh, there is uh, still that capacity to deliver and uh, people's trust that uh, at, at least uh, there's uh, enough regulation in the system to know that uh, it's not going to be abused by SK Telecom or whatever, a yeah? mm -hmm. uh, big company that's uh, that, uh, controlling the data. So I think that uh, these uh, two 
uh, uh, somewhat related issues of hubris and trust, I think, uh, mm -hmm. uh, are the, the most uh, important uh, yeah. factors that uh, make differences, sometimes huge differences uh, between different countries. Mm -hmm. and, and it's, One other it, point, if I could, which is yeah. if you look around in comparative context, <clears throat> you could see lots of business interests right from the very start demanding no lockdown. I mean, you could see this in uh, the various, even um, some of the uh, leading German economics institutes and people that are rather their heads. Uh, you could see Swedish industrialists in Britain. It got kind of crazy. It was sitting on the front pages of the London Times, Tory grandees demand uh, and the lockdown, stuff like that. And in the United States, it's no secret. Um, it shows up everywhere, but in recent articles uh, on why things didn't. Um, uh, the so-called kitchen cabinet of President Trump and many other interests just pressed him massively not to lock down. And that pressure has never abated. And it has clearly, uh, as we slide into second and third wave lockdowns, this issue is yet again uh, I think coming to the fore. Mm -hmm. And then maybe to add to that, uh, Professor Ferguson, uh, it, it's interesting that you mentioned the issue of the regulation of telecommunications. Uh, would it be a bit of a dangerous overstretch to also say that a lot of the, in a lot of the places where the lockdown was successful and the implementation was successful, is countries where there is a, a lack of democratic accountability or yeah, uh, weak democratic accountability? Countries like Sing Singapore, for example. Uh, would that be a, a variable you see as, as kind of like the main factor which determined uh, can't, can't be the uh, Can't be the main factor hmm. uh, for Ha Jung's reasons. I mean, he just gave you several examples of country. You know, South Korea is not, cannot be treated as simply uh, a top-down authoritarian run place. It's not like that. Mm -hmm. um, and I agree that having a it's rather less what in, in it's the specific function of the state, I think. And if people are used to it, and as Hajun said, trust, that really matters. Mm -hmm. uh, and specifically on the functions that you need to actually deliver on. Mm -hmm. um, that said, I would agree that a general authoritarianism probably operates in the background sometimes. And it, but they but I mean, there's all authoritarian states all over the place. You know, you know what you got? India is a democracy, but on the other hand, doesn't act like one. Mm -hmm. Even Kerala finally went to pieces on its um, uh, COVID treatment. Um, I I don't think uh, that issue is I think too simply posed. Uh, you got to look beneath the general label um, and get more institutionally specific. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. I mean, you have uh, countries like uh, Norway, Finland, you know, New Zealand, uh, whose uh, democratic credentials that, that, that cannot be questioned, and uh, they've done very well with this. But I think uh, that uh, what uh, Tom said earlier, I mean, that this uh, anti-lockdown kind of uh, that thinking, you know, I think uh, those people got their kind of uh, causal uh, priorities wrong because. <laughs> In South Korea, you know, everything is open. Okay, occasionally in certain regions, if it is really bad, they might close down nightclub and ban the spectators in the sports games. But throughout the period, everything has been open. You know, the, the saunas and you know, clubs and the, the restaurants, everything, because the, the, the disease has been contained so successfully. You know, it, uh, it uh, hits the headline if uh, the, the, in a country with uh, 50 million people, a uh, daily case uh, goes over 100, you know. So that, that actually the, the best way to keep the economy open is to control the disease. Yeah? If you fail to do that, then, yeah, you have a choice between are we going to kill 10,000 more people or going to the, the, the increase uh, GDP by X percent, which is such a kind of unacceptable choice. So, you know, these people who thought that, that they got the, the, were making an inevitable trade-off, you know, that, that they just uh, didn't understand the best way to 
actually keep the economy afloat is uh, to control the disease uh, as uh, early and as uh, effectively possible. Yeah, this point could be generalized. I entirely agree with Hachun. <clears throat> there was a plan brewed for a while at the start in the Trump administration to send masks to everybody, use the post office to get them out. Uh, now, they had the small problem, they didn't have the masks, <laughs> and they didn't do anything serious to get it. Uh, they just didn't use the Defense Production Act. But if you had distributed masks free and done free testing, as it's te people are still paying for tests in parts of the United States, I know that, even though there's a lot of talk about that, but I'm sure that is true in other countries, or they have trouble, they don't have to pay, but they have to queue for some days. I mean, uh, the sort of socialist form of high price, uh, as it were. Um, the uh, You could have saved enormous amounts of money, all this central bank intervention and a lot of fiscal policy. It would have been a whole lot easier to do the health system and uh, free distribution of masks and things like that. And, you know, I understand that people don't have, you know, the personal protective equipment, PPE. Well, they can't uh immediately offer that although our folks compounded it by denying that masks uh would help right i mean that's even uh, dr Fochi uh, for a while made some noises like that um and but there's just you could save enormous sums with effective health care intervention and in the broad sense to include testing <clears throat> and things like that they're not doing that. Instead, we're going to look, you know what's going to happen. It's already happened. I mean, you, the governments are going to pour out fiscal, uh, direct fiscal aid. It's going to be mostly to businesses, not all of it. Uh, and they, you know, the central banks are well, you know, standing ready to do. They just by announcing the U.S. Fed turned out not to have to put so much money out. But this is going to leave people with very high debts. And despite all the noise coming from, the usual suspects that we don't have to worry about debts right now. Anybody can see, if you like, the vultures gathering two or three years down the yield curve right now uh, for uh, pressures there. Yeah, so uh, speaking of the US, uh, the COVID-19 uh, is redrawing new economic boundaries. And uh, according to the forecast by the OECD, uh, America's economy will be the same size as it was in 2019 but uh, the Chinese economy will be 10% larger. Uh, also, the U.S. has the depression levels of unemployment. Um, can all these factors, uh, can, can they be seen um, as a threat to the Western hegemony? Well, since, look, I'm not a fan of Western hegemony to start out with, okay? So, like, I can't, a threat might be an opportunity. On the other hand, I don't think uh, the Chinese state as it currently functions is so wonderful either. Uh, and so, uh, like, your real issue here um, probably has to be posed in terms of multipolar worlds, uh, the type of internal coalitions that come to power in those situations, they're generally not good. I mean, we've run this experiment a few times before, and it doesn't seem to work out too well uh, thus far. Um, and uh, so, yeah, what would you like to, I mean, I'd love to hear Hajun's view on this. Yeah, well, the, you have to understand that I the, come from a country which has been bullied by big neighbors for literally 5,000 years, you know, the, the Chinese, the Japanese, the Mongols, uh, the later the Russians, the Americans, the Manchus, uh, you name it. So, <laughs> I'm against all form of uh, the hegemony and domination. <laughs> I mean, the, for me, the, the, the American imperialism is uh, as bad as the, the Chinese one, which is as bad as uh, the Japanese one and so on. So the, yeah, I the, actually the, the will be very worried if uh, China replaces the US uh, as a hegemon. But you know, the, I think uh, that the, what Tom has uh, just uh, predicted of more multipolar world. I mean, that is uh, certain, and that might actually be a good thing, you know. The, of course, that that, that uh, carries the uh, danger of, you know, the, of uh, global war and so on. But uh, I don't think that uh, at least uh, in the next uh, the, the twenty 
years that the Chinese are keen on that kind of taking the American zone uh, in military terms and probably they, they never will uh, because that, that they, they are, I mean, less actually, the, despite what people think, uh, less driven by political ambition than the, uh, the kind of uh, desire to uh, expand their economy. You know, that, that if a lot of uh, Chinese action, which uh, look like uh, aggression and is uh, aggression vis-a-vis -vis some economies, are motivated by their desire to kind of uh, push back uh, what they see as uh, American encirclement of China. Mm -hmm. So uh, the Chinese are not as uh, the kind of militarily aggressive as uh, the, 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 what uh, many uh, Westerners think. But uh, yeah, having said that, you know, I don't think it will be that easy to kind of uh, weaken American hegemony because that. Uh, like it or not, that uh, the Americans control the world currency. You know, uh, it's not, of course, uh, what it used to be, but the U.S. dollar is uh, still the world currency. You know? It uh, controls that uh, uh, huge uh, the kind of cultural infrastructure in terms of uh, the, the English language and uh, the education system and uh, the, the internet, the, the news media. You know that. You have to see this uh, the, in historical context, yeah? because that the, the, the first the English and then American domination has a uh, history of a couple of centuries at least. Yeah? Mm -hmm. I mean, you cannot just that, that, that wipe that out uh, simply because China becomes, I don't know, that twenty percent bigger than the U.S. economy. So uh, I think it will be long time in coming uh, if uh, hegemony ever changes, and yeah, we really need to think about ways to, you know, that, that building a stable multipolar world uh, rather than trying to choose between one bad hegemon and another bad hegemon and uh, a third uh, even worse hegemon. Yeah? So I think that uh, that's uh, how uh, I would uh, suggest that we think about this. So what, what kind Can of- I follow uh, that up just yes, a bit? Yes, I, as usual, agree with Ha Jun. Um, the, um, the issue, I think, is partly the dollar, but I'm, I don't share the confidence of, for instance, many modern money theory people that you can't have major currency crises uh, in that. That's just, look, I've lived through one of those uh, in the late 70s, and I remember quite dramatically. It can, and you can see, if you watch carefully the dynamics between Europe and the US right now, you can see all kinds of funny little things. Uh, happening, including you know, the rise in the price of gold, that tells you there's a lot of people thinking about alternative stores of value, and even you know moving to the Japanese yen or something. There aren't too many folks going to rush into the Ranimbi because when you get in, you probably can't get out necessarily. Um, but all right, um, but then there is also the question of the digital economy. And there, I've never subscribed to the view that the Chinese were going to be overwhelmingly dominant. I mean, you just look at semiconductors and many patents, and you don't see that overwhelming pattern uh, of dominance. I'm not saying the U.S. stays dominant either. What impresses me is how little the Europeans count in this digital world. Hmm. And particularly as you generalize more digital things into either automobiles uh, where you've got this, you've got a crisis building in the world car industry that is gigantic because you're looking at structural unemployment on a colossal scale in many countries. And I, I noticed that in Europe, you can see if you look just beneath the uh, surface, a lot of people doing things. I mean, uh, the, the, what, the Germans, the Spanish, uh, the French have some plans. Other countries don't necessarily have plans, but they have cars, and the parts industries are going to dry up and blow away in a good chunk of middle Europa. Uh, I don't quite get what people do next. I asked a German economist I know, how do you guys plan to solve this? The answer I got was, I have no idea. Um, there. Um, that's, but then there is the scary problem, and here is where people really need to do some thinking. It's the backdoor problem in communications. 
I mean, what brought for by everybody by Snowden. Because what Snowden did was he showed you somebody is always able to get into your little machine. You may think it's encrypted, but it's not. Um, and that you could see in the next few years a kind of revolution in the world arms industry as people started buying and selling different planes when they suddenly realized, you know what, we could get into a war and the U.S. or the Russians or the Chinese could turn off my fighters or something like that. Um, and now this business is going to broaden. And I have two concerns about that. One is the international relations side of it. Uh, they need to find a way so they can do trade that doesn't do, proceed on an exclusive basis. And then the other one is how do you keep the populations actually safe? I'm not a believer that as the, right now the surveillance state is looking inevitable to me almost everywhere, and the pandemic will accelerate this. And, and is, uh, is that where you think we will get our growth from, from mo in the future, from mostly the car industry or, as you said, from the, the arms industry? Is that... Uh, kind of the way out of the, the, the economic recession caused by the corona crisis? No, you don't have to do that. Uh, you could actually uh, support quite different sectors. I'm the biggest single sector in the United States right now is healthcare. But I'm sure Hajun has some ideas about this too, and I'd love to hear them. Uh, yeah, no, I think there are some. I mean, in terms of uh, the economic structure and uh, where post-pandemic uh, the economic growth is going to come and how we rebuild our economies and so on. I mean, there are some things that are more or less certain to happen, you know, the, a lot of face-to-face uh, -face services will have to restructure you know, even after after the, we get a safe vaccine, you know, the, there's always a the threat of yet another pandemic. You know, the, some kind of environmental scientists and epidemiologists uh, have been warning about this uh, for a couple of decades at least. Uh, the, and uh, this is only the biggest uh, and the latest one that we might get more. So I think that a lot of those will have to restructure a lot of labor intensive industries like uh, the making garments or the food processing, I mean, they have to the restructure. And and yeah, I mean, the people will the consume more things, you know, the, through uh, the delivery. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So the online shoppings are going to become more important. So that uh, there are these things that are going to happen. Yeah? Mm -hmm. However, that uh, beyond that, I mean, it's uh, our choice. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, are we going to, you know, use this as an opportunity to, you know, that uh, go for some kind of uh, the, well, I mean, for the lack, lack of a better term, uh, green growth. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I, are we going to restructure our education sector in a way that that involves uh, more online learning? I mean, what does that mean in terms of, you know, yeah. uh, international mobility of students? That, uh, what does that mean in terms of uh, the, the teaching content? And you know, that there are a lot of things that are still that, uh, uncertain and will change according to what we decide, you know, mm -hmm. according to what we want. You know? yeah. And uh, this is a time to have that conversation. You know? mm -hmm. And, and that, uh, we will definitely yeah. touch on uh, green growth as well uh, in, in just a few moments. But uh, I also want to talk about a different kind of restructuring that is going on in the global economy right now. Uh, and that is the basically the popularity of austerity policies as, as the kind of uh, a very dominant mode of, of policy making. Uh, so very recently, uh, Carmen Reinhardt, uh, an economist who was very much pushing for austerity policies in the 2010s, right after the, the 2008 financial crisis, uh, said that uh, when, when fighting this crisis, first you have to worry about fighting the war, then you figure out how to pay for it. Uh, and on top of that, uh, G20 countries have recently agreed to mobilize 2% of global GDP as a stimulus to fight this. 
so uh, the question is, will this crisis really be the straw uh, to break austerity's back? Uh, Professor Ferguson. Uh, no, is the short, blunt answer. I mean, look, I'm, I sometimes am in meetings that are under Chatham House rules, which means you can't actually report. I've heard plenty of people who elsewhere in public will say uh, oh, the same thing that Carmen Reinhart, you just quoted, said, which is that we have to fight the current war first. And then they, you know, then they will turn around and say, but of course, we'll later, uh, we'll come back. The, the notion that you're going to just pile up public debt, which, I mean, there never was anything to the Robert Barrow type stuff that actually said everybody instantly adjusts expenditures to, based on expected future, uh, you know, recording equivalents of public debt. But on the other hand, there's certainly a lot of wealthy folks who think, uh-oh, there it is. They think about taxes a lot. You can see them move money right on the basis of that. Uh, right in markets, you can see them moving in. You know, right now, there's discussions all over about will the Biden. You can. There's already efforts to lower the Biden uh, pro. Oh. Get started uh, there, and it's the same in Europe. Uh, I mean, look, if the Germans go back to their debt break, they suspended that, and I think they extended that for another year or so. Uh, if they go back to the, take the debt break off and just try to act like you can now go back to the new abnormal, that's what I call it, um, then uh, all of Europe is going to have us very serious trouble because Germany is a giant part of that. If they're going to have to start paying down their debts. Um, if you think that's all going to vanish because of a bunch of things that people say now before an American election, there is going to be nobody. Hardly at all, only a few folks, some Republican senators, a few people who advised them, who said, no, don't kill, kill the second stimulus. Um, but, you know, wait till elections happen in the U.S. and Germany, especially, and see what happens. I would observe that despite all the noise about how we shouldn't worry about the pandemic and, and just spend, you'll notice when Wall Street straightened out, that was the end of the stimulus in the United States. It did not, even though uh, on the face of it, you'd have expected the folks, even the Trump people, to want a second one. They didn't, and it didn't happen. It's not going to happen. If it happens now, it won't matter before the election. Um, and you got to take the point here. No, uh, this, is, this is where economic history is really very useful. Um, and, you know, I'd love to hear Hajung. I'd just love to read his stuff. So uh, you, uh, can I just pass this to you? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, no, I, I uh, broadly agree with uh, Tom. Uh, yeah, I think it's interesting that uh, Reinhardt uh, is uh, now essentially drawing analogy with uh, the Second World War, which uh, was a unique event because no, after the Second World War, uh, I don't know about the U.S., but uh, in the U.K., public debt to GDP ratio shot up to something like two hundred and seventy percent. And it was yeah, uh, it was uh, very high. That's yeah. Right, pay down over a long period, like uh, over a couple of decades of quite high growth. Mm -hmm. So at uh, that time, they uh, managed this. But uh, what uh, Thomas uh, the, the implying is that the power configuration is different now. Yeah? Because in those days, you had uh, very strong trade unions in a lot of countries, social democratic governments. You know, uh, 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 did you realize that, that uh, the US, unbeknownst to most people, had communist uh, presidents in the 1940s and 50s, you know, under Truman and Eisenhower, the top in income tax rate was 92%. Yeah? I mean, unimaginable today, even in the, the, the most uh, left-wing uh, countries that, uh, in the world. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So that, 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 that was a time when the full employment was uh, the overarching goal. Financial sector was uh, the, the very much uh, restrained yeah? uh, the, in the aftermath of the, 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 the Great Depression. So that uh, you didn't have those uh, the rich folks that uh, Tom talked about who will that uh, leap at the idea that, that 
you know, we need to bring back uh, austerity because uh, the, the otherwise taxes are going to have to rise. Yeah? So I think uh, that uh, you have to understand this uh, changes in political economy, which is not to say that uh, it will never change, we can never change it, yeah? but it will take time. Yeah? It will uh, uh, need different kinds of uh, organizing, you know, different types of uh, the, the, the popular pressure on the politicians than the, the traditional the, the political system has been able to deliver. And on, until we yeah, the, the rein in the you know, financial sector, until we close down the tax havens, until we you know, the, the can the, the, the raise uh, the top income taxes uh, significantly, until politics uh, changes sufficiently to be able to do that, Yes, I, I totally agree with that, Tom, that uh, austerity will come back uh, sooner or later. Mm -hmm. But surely it's it's somewhat of but a positive sign this. that the IMF is also on board with this. The IMF has also declared that it is it is supporting like very much stimulus and anti-austerity policies. At least yeah, it's a now, good sign. Yes, uh, but, uh, right you know, now, take yeah. the point. You really need to take the point because um, in Italy, for example, the question there utterly paranoid about being told, okay, go spend, build yourself some hospitals right now, and in three or four years, dismantle them. They start getting under uh, some deficit target. And everybody in finance knows that's quite possible. Again, the German break dis uh, um, debt break discussion is going to be critical uh, here. Um, I, if you're where people need to start focusing on is actually, yeah, the pol partisan political side. I should observe that now I'm not talking for anybody but myself, not any organization that I'm a part of. Um, the um, the black green coalition type situation to use the German version, but or if you want to see where these folks are sometimes sitting, um, you know, the the role of uh, uh, even the Aust current Austrian government has some, it may be a, a somewhat shadow of the future. Not There's a lot of peculiarities there. Austria is somewhat different. I actually went years ago to school there, so I have some sense of that. Uh, but the um, a lot of green parties, when you are represent very affluent constituencies, they are often, they're quite happy to spend on green stuff um uh, there they have different views it's there's not they're not all of a piece um inside those parties not anywhere on the question of taxation of the rich and things like that uh but uh it's obviously you can see that lots of politicians on the right in europe are looking to see if they can possibly explore arrangements with green parties and might that is you probably can i i consider barack obama the first green uh candidate in the united states yeah. uh, that was that portion of the democratic party they you could see how in the democratic party the idea of the green new deal was rejected by the leadership they couldn't have been blunter about that you can see when the Green New Deal trans went across the Atlantic uh, to Ursula von der Leyen and others, it turned into the Green Deal. They got rid of the new part of it, and then they cut that down. And the agricultural policy and the other stuff that they had to have to do to sort of go along with that has just not happened. It's stuck, folks. Um, but you need a Green New Deal uh, to just build on a theme that uh, Hajun had, well, I think, introduced first. Yeah, so um, you mentioned already um, Professor Ferguson, the American elections, definitely a topic that we have to discuss uh, today because in about a week we know who's going to be uh, the next president of the United States, of course. No, you don't. Be careful. That would be my first warning. Yep. Okay, yeah. Thank, thanks for that. Um, so um, we want to make the co uh, to compare uh, back in 2008, then uh, the financial crisis uh, was a big part of uh, that, that played a big role in uh, the United uh, States, their elections. And then a lot of scholars argue that um, the financial crisis really helped um, Barack Obama to become elected. Uh, and at this moment, uh, Biden is in favor, if we have uh, to believe the polls, of course. Um, so does it uh, say that the Democrats are riding easier out of this storm called COVID, do you think? 
Well, yeah, I actually give a few talks on this from time to time. I can't help it. Um, one is tempted to say that this sort of, it's like harvest time in a Spanish town uh, for me, and I'm an agricultural worker, and I just go out there and can pick all the grapes I want, um, time permitting. But um, bottom line is, yeah, the right now, you can see the democratic theory of this as COVID got worse. By the time they actually got around the nominating Biden was, Let's run 2008, meaning the world's collapsing. Uh, let's just stand by. Let's get Biden uh, rarely to appear, not to talk too much, not to pass out COVID to people, a lesson Trump didn't absorb, uh, as we know. Yeah, the, the Republicans were trying to run uh, a 21st century, uh, late 20, later 21st century version uh, of um, 1968, they were trying to run on law and order, but with industrial transformation, uh, what make America great again was the popular slogan, also an essential part of that. Huge numbers of people in both in and out of the United States claim that the, you know, the 2016 victory was about uh, basically race and women issues. Um, and it was, those were important, but, and I got so tired of hearing that I actually sat down and did went into the American National Election Survey and with several other people, Ben Page and I and some others, we did a paper on who actually voted for Trump. You can see that economics was important. These are the people who were left out of the recovery and Obama. I mean, I, I, on this endless claim about race, um, identity politics determining everything isn't true. Uh, okay, now you've got COVID operating as a massive problem. And, you know, Trump just looks terrible on that. And it's peaking again, just as people go to vote. And the White House was obviously in a total mess. They had the chief of staff, Meadows, saying the other day, in actually confessing they couldn't control the virus at all. Uh, I mean, it, I, it's hard to think of worse time. And, and then they sort of, they didn't take the point that ha Jun and I have both been making, which is that if you want the economy to go, you actually have to take care of the health of the population. And they didn't. So uh, for now, should we get then our hopes for Biden? Well, uh, all right, I, I'm very reluctant to sort of, but I'm perfectly happy to say what I've said time and again. You can see two camps at war in the Biden camp. Uh, they, to get elected, they, I mean, or actually, let's just back up and review the bidding. They defeat, Biden defeated Sanders and Warren. Um, that was over just as COVID started up. Uh, but COVID then underscored the enormous importance of medical care for all. Um, that was the centerpiece of Sanders and Warren's campaign. It wasn't the only plank in either, but it was a big part of it. Um, and the irony here is that it was the poor black districts in the South whose leaders went overwhelmingly for Biden that delivered the key Southern victory. Now, those folks are not looking all that great right now, except that they might have backed a winner. They have got to decide what they really want to do because their populations, blacks and Hispanics have suffered more than any ethnic group, Native Americans too. I mean, the, the numbers here, uh, which are hard to get and were, I think, quite clearly suppressed for a long time, mm -hmm. um, are just terrible. Um, and the, at the, during the convention, Ted Kaufman, who's close to Biden, and I think represents his instinctive point of view, uh, was saying, we know that we can't spend forever, mm -hmm. that we, the cupboard will be kind of bare. Then they had to walk it back under great criticism. This issue is not finished at all. We are the morning after. If let me, I caution that there are serious problems about whether all the state counts will be accepted quickly and clear on election day. Mm -hmm. That's I'm, what I'm saying now is putting it mildly because um, the possibilities of court challenge, militia uprisings that you know hijack not a governor but polls and things like that. All of this is quite possible. Uh, but it, no, it's not clear at all what a Biden administration will do, except I expect him to move on the green part of the agenda. If he doesn't put people back to work 
quickly. Um, he, what happened to actually in the Clinton first term, um, and then again in Barack Obama's first term, where they blew the immediate House elections in the following two years, and the, typically the Senate too, they had disaster, electoral reverses. That will happen again. So um, do you think that we will see the oil lobbies crushed under Biden uh, or, or will the status quo, what we're facing right now, persist towards more green? If I, if I have to bet, I bet a little they will do the least they can and it will prove not enough. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and now just relating to, again, the persistence of uh, oil lobbies, fossil fuel lobbies, uh, we have seen a significant amount of disinvesting and turning away from fossil fuel companies, especially we've seen uh, oil go into negative prices uh, a few months ago. Uh, Professor Hajun Chang, do you think that this change, which is, is, is good on the surface of it, will, will be damaging for uh, a lot of oil exporting countries, oil dependent countries, which are uh, relatively poor and still developing? Yeah, I mean, uh, it's uh, certainly going to hurt uh, those countries in the short run, but uh, also some of those countries are countries that are being on the front line of uh, climate change. At, uh, you know, so, I mean, costs from uh, the extreme weather events and so on, uh, you know, they'll have to count those that are against uh, the loss in uh, oil revenue. But yeah, I think that, uh, I mean, I'm not an expert on the environmental issues, but uh, you know, talking to people who are more of an expert uh, in the field, I mean, uh, they are now saying that actually these uh, alternative uh, energy sources are going to be pretty soon uh, competitive in terms of cost uh, with oil. Mm -hmm. And uh, with a bit of a push, uh, we may turn the table and yeah, that uh, some of the richer oil countries are very aware that you know their days are numbered. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, for one thing, that, that uh, oil is finite. You know, that you cannot make it even if you want it. But uh, secondly, a lot of countries are that, 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 uh, running out of uh, reserve. You know, of course, that that uh, oil exploration and uh, drilling technology keeps uh, advancing. So now we are uh, extracting oil. You know, literally thousands of meters that are below the that uh, seabed, but you know that there's uh, clearly going to be a limit. And yeah, not all, but uh, many companies are actually trying to see whether they can become an energy company rather than oil company by investing in alternative energies and so on. So I think you know that we are that uh, for the first time quite close to flipping this. Mm -hmm. Because that uh, if uh, it was 10, 15 years ago, you know, that you can talk until your throat is raw uh, about the need to you know, but, uh, replace oil with other energy sources, but uh, that technologically they, they were just not there. Yeah? This time we are close, uh, not quite there, but uh, you know, the, you know, with a bit of boost that, that we can uh, change this. And yeah, in the long run, I mean, the, everyone will benefit from this. You know, the, the, the problem with our current economic thinking is that, uh, you know, given all this uh, method of uh, cost benefit analysis with time discount, anything that happens uh, after 50 years is uh, pretty irrelevant. But this is a problem that uh, has consequences for centuries and then that, that, that potentially that to the end of uh, the, the humanity. So, you know, we need to think uh, differently uh, about this time. and. Yeah, I think uh, the pandemic has done a little service uh, in that respect by making people realize uh, the importance of uh, this uh, common destiny, like a global pandemic or climate crisis that I mean, doesn't that, uh, uh, let anyone escape it. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And, and uh, for the first time, people have seen that actually things can uh, change. You know, that I'm told by my Indian friends that they've seen clear blue sky for the first time in a couple of decades in New Delhi because of uh, the lockdown. So, you know, that people realize how much impact that, that they are making on the environment. So I think there are these uh, glimmers of hope, but uh, that, you know, it's such a big issue with a lot of uh, money and power at stake. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, I, I the, the, not not being that the, the well versed enough in international politics that uh, I, I that, that just that, that cannot uh, make any clear uh, prediction here. Mm -hmm. But one one issue that is Can definitely I just make a comment. Oh, please, yes. <laughs> yeah, a um, couple problems here. I looked at some of this literature and. I have the sense that people are a little optimistic on how much carbon pricing will help them. That is to say, it does reduce pollution, but not enough. The other side of this that's really crucial, I think, is as you squeeze these energy economies, particularly where they're not in a small country with a dictatorship and almost no people, um, then you're going to have serious political repercussions. Um, I mean, the problem of how to sort of preserve the population as you raise the price of energy has not been solved. It, I mean, the yellow vest story in France is your fire bell ringing in the night. Um, I mean, that was very, it was instructive because after you got all these people saying that populism was all about you know, identity politics. Nobody could say that about the yellow vest. That was perfectly obvious uh, there. And the question of how you make the transition, if you don't find serious work, you need to reverse. I mean, Lance Taylor and some other people have sort of noticed that, you know, the, youth, the old W. Arthur Lewis model where you move people in out of the countryside the higher productivity jobs in the city, it's working in reverse. Now you throw them out of work and they, they don't move back to the countryside, but they sit there and they haven't got any. You got to solve that problem. If you don't, there won't be any serious uh, green politics except enormously divisive. Mm -hmm. um, and just to maybe uh, finalize this section, because unfortunately we are uh, running quite low on time, uh, however, one big news that has really kind of changed the global perception on, on decarbonization is that uh, China has recently said that it will commit to carbon neutrality by 2060. Uh, what do you make of this and how do we move forward uh, with green growth while simultaneously maintaining development, particularly for countries that need it? Uh, Professor Hajun Chang, you can begin. <laughs> Oh yes. Uh, well, I mean, the, you know, China compared to the rich countries uh, when they were at similar stages of development have done a lot to kind of reduce uh, carbon emission. Uh, partly because that, that that people 30 years ago didn't know so much about the, the consequences of climate change, but also because that that. China, that uh, you know, it's a very complex animal, and that uh, somehow uh, seem to have decided that uh, you know it can that uh, at least partly have its uh, cake and eat it because that uh, that uh, it uh, sees uh, business opportunities in green energy. You know, China is that uh, well ahead of uh, even South Korea in terms of uh, solar panel uh, technology, and it's uh, right up there with uh, the the European uh, and, and uh, countries and the US that uh, is uh, fast uh, catching up on things like wind and so on. So uh, it's uh, not entirely kind of you know, uh, you know, out of virtue, but uh, still uh, for whatever reason, it has uh, decided that uh, it's uh, going to do it. But, you know, we can all ask a question, you know, the, my own South Korea, uh, my own native country said that it will go carbon neutral by 2050, but, you know, uh, are all of this uh, going to be enough, you know? I mean, 2050 is, uh, you know, the, I probably won't be even alive when that, that, that is uh, 2050, you know? It's a long time away and that, that we have but that, that all this, that the polar ice caps melting and huge uh, the glaciers uh, disappearing in the various uh, the parts of Europe and North America, you know, that we have a serious problem. So I don't know how, I mean, that, that, that kind of uh, the, the goal, I mean, better than nothing, of course, that uh, is uh, going to uh, help us. But, you know, having said that, I think uh, for poorer, smaller developing countries, I think uh, they should uh, be allowed to grow uh, even in 
dirty ways because you know all calculations uh, show that what they do isn't really going to make a material difference at, uh, to climate change. And for those countries, you know, when you are really poor, economic growth is uh, literally a matter of life and death. Yeah? It's not about uh, having another TV. It's not about uh, having, well, uh, you don't watch TV these days, uh, another uh, laptop. Uh, it's not about uh, having uh, another holiday abroad. I mean, it's about uh, eating another bowl of rice, uh, that, uh, being able to take uh, medicine once more and then uh, not having to see the, your the baby die before it uh, reaches one. So I think that uh, for countries at very low levels of development, say below five, $6,000 per capita income, we should make all the allowances, which means that other countries are going to have to do a lot more, a lot faster. But I think uh, that that's the only way to deal with uh, climate change in a just way, because that uh, you know sometimes that uh, people in rich countries they, they are developing countries that uh, shouldn't grow because that uh, it's uh, going to destroy planet. A, you know, you have to think about historical justice. You know, that, you know that these countries are not responsible for the carbon in the air at the moment. And B, you know, uh, different countries need different things. Yeah, so you know that these countries might say, yeah, that, that never mind uh, that uh, you know we are going to get hit by climate change and that, that have a own kind of uh, the natural environment destroyed in 20 years time if you don't uh, uh, grow and develop in 20 years time literally millions of uh, the people will die of hunger and uh, disease so you, know, you have to uh, make that allowance uh, different countries at different stages of uh, development they need uh, the different approaches uh, to this thank you Yes, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chung. So uh, we have to uh, wrap up, sadly enough, but uh, we want to uh, make you both uh, have the room for one last point because we've talked about the pandemic and how it uh, reacted different uh, reactions from different countries, big money politics and the future of the environment. But we still have one last question because uh, yeah, we still have, uh, are encircled by the pandemic. So uh, what can we do as a society to overcome this long COVID? First, um, for you, Mr. Ferguson. I'm, I'm not quite sure I caught the, the whole question for the first time. I had just a little audio trouble, but if it's a question, what can we do as a society to sort of make some intelligent decisions on climate? Look, not just the United States, but every, all about the whole Western world We'll set the Eastern one out there. That they have it too, I guarantee you. Uh, money and politics problems are overwhelming. I mean, you can see um, there. There, I, my colleagues and I have done this linear model of money and elections, where it turns out you can predict the party split in uh, the House and Senate based on the party split in money. And that turned out to work for every election, and we were able to eliminate endogeneity. So that money wasn't flowing because of public opinion. And I think our published version of that is clear on that. Um, and there are studies that looked at, say, hundreds of questions um, of polls where you could sort of get a clear conclusion, and then you could see what public policy did. And they came to the conclusion, that's particularly McGillan's and Page papers, um, that the poor, and for that matter, and nobody except the top 10% in income uh, had any impact on uh, policy at all. Um, and uh, there were, I'm just reading a paper uh, that I'm about to comment on where it's clear that this is really just money politics in disguise. That 10% opinion thing is just all you can measure. Um, and that's not a peculiarly American outcome. Somebody looked and found uh, the linear model in French elections for 20 some years. Um, and the Germans, I went around Germany for a while just saying, look folks, you've got the same problem as the US. Um, and nobody believed it, but then they replicated the Gillens and Page stuff on Germany and they get the same results. The, you are sliding into a kind of affluent authoritarianism 
that is silent and everybody is pretending that it's not happening. Um, but it is. And in truth, I think as you mutate income distributions to crazy levels in the US where we know we're a world leader in that, but where this is happening everywhere, including Germany, including Austria, uh, you name it. Um, at some point you pass into a, uh, you just go beyond the pillars of Hercules and you just lose popular control of governments. This is a serious problem, but you still have the democratic forms. You, you're not going to fix climate without fixing that. I, I... And for you, Mr. Chung, one last note. Yeah, I just uh, want to be brief uh, that we are out of time and uh, that we have uh, covered a lot of ground. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think uh, the biggest enemy of reform is to believe that there is no alternative. You know? uh, it's uh, to believe that, that, that there may be alternative, but they are all unrealistic. You know? But uh, you know, that you have to think uh, long term. You know, that 200 years ago, there were a lot of people around the world who think uh, buying and selling people were totally okay. You know? Slavery was legal in many countries. You know, you know 100 years ago, that the uh, countries uh, put women in prison for asking for vote. You know? 60, 70 years ago, the, all the leaders of today's, uh, the, sorry, founding fathers of uh, today's uh, the post-colonial societies in Asia and Africa were being hunted down by the French and the, the British and the Dutch for being uh, terrorists. Yeah? And then only 30 years ago, Margaret Thatcher famously commented that if anyone thinks that there'll be a black majority rule in South Africa, that person is uh, living in a cloud cuckoo land. Yeah? But uh, all of these things have happened, not automatically, not uh, because of some miraculous uh, the economic development or whatever, but uh, the people have fought for it. You know? They, they the, the argued for it. Uh, they the, the fought for it. And yeah, I think uh, a lot of uh, the changes will happen only if we fight for it. But a lot of uh, the, the big changes can happen if we do that. You know? so I think I want to the, the, the end with that the, the note of optimism. Uh, well, thank you for that uh, inspirational and still grounded uh, ending. Uh, we do have to end our interview here, but I want to thank both of you uh, once again. Thank you, Professor Thomas Ferguson and Professor Hajun Chung uh, for being with us. And also thank you for uh, UCL for cooperating with us uh, to make this interview happen. Uh, we will still be hosting interviews on business, politics and economics uh, and this pandemic is not going anywhere soon, so we will we'll still have a lot of podcasts uh, readily available on YouTube and Facebook. So please uh, tune in whenever possible. For now, thank you.